Uh, good evening, everyone. How's everyone tonight? Oh, good. Not too bad. Not too bad. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman. I'm the program director here at the Armory. Welcome. And um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a very quick question. How many people have seen the show? How many people have seen Yerma? Okay, so a few people, fantastic. Um, well, we have a wonderful treat for you tonight. We have, of course, the director, Simon Stone, who's gonna be with us, and we've had such uh, a pleasure having him here for the last couple weeks putting this show together, and he will be in conversation with the amazing Anne Bogart. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Anne and Simon. Hello, everybody. Hi. In this glorious room that we're sharing, we'll just keep looking around. <laughs> so uh, I don't know about you, Simon, but I'm delighted to be here with you. And uh, I noticed that not so many people have seen the show already, so we'll try not to give it away. And it's my job, actually, to orient you to Simon Stone, but I really can't, because he's a very confusing young man with an emphasis on the word young. It's obscene what you've done. <laughs> Do you know what the etymology of obscene is? No. It means off stage, op -sena. Oh, Of course. Yeah. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? Anyway, it's obscene what you've done. And I'd love to say he's from Australia, but he's not. <laughs> he was born in Switzerland. He lives in Vienna. I have no idea, except I would say that I saw this production that we're not going to give away secrets about <laughs> last summer at the Young Vic, and I sent Simon a fan email. I had to contact the head of the theater and say, give me Simon's email. Anyway, so he finally responded about a week ago. <laughs> that was last summer. <laughs> by, uh, because, because I got an email from uh, Avery, who you just met, saying, would you come and... Um, talk to Simon, so I guess he read my email about how much I loved his show. So without further ado, let's just dive in, and let's start because the play is based on Lorca. So I would just start by saying, besides I'm so thrilled to actually get to know you, um, uh, Lorca. Why Lorca, and, and, and how, how, how did you make the translation from Lorca to the world of you? <clears throat> um, the short answer is that David Land called me and said, what about doing Yerma? You can't answer like that. Um, That's not fair. Did you have a relationship to uh, Lorca and Yerma? I had a kind of sniffing relationship of kind of like, I've read all these, pl you know, sometimes you just kind of go back to the bookshelf and read them again and... And I'd read Yerma like three times at various points. And so maybe I'm going to change my question. Why do you think that he thought you were the right person to do Yerma? I don't know. I don't David know. Land is don't a very smart man, a playwright and an artist. I, I really don't know why he thought that. Because the reason I said yes immediately was because I'd, in, in, I'd been through a relationship where nothing nearly as extreme as what happens in, in the play happens, but, um, mm -hmm. but certainly had kind of dealt with that territory. And, and I had read the play, all of the times that I'd read it were before having had that experience. And then when David Land said, what about Yerma, I went, oh, I've actually had an experience that is relevant to that play now. <laughs> and he, um, did, he didn't know that. He clearly. didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, he might have intuited it on my in my presence or something. I don't know, but um, he 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 said, and I went, oh yes, yes, that's a great idea. And it, it gives nothing away. The the, the the subject is a woman trying to give birth. Yeah, a, a, a couple. Uh, uh, well, what begins is a couple trying to 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 right. become uh, pregnant, and and what ends is a very solitary woman. Um, uh, abandoned in that relationship and um, yeah so I was kind of I was like we uh, and also I was yeah, there's a certain thing that's happening in 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 the wealthier cities in the world uh, in certain suburbs uh, where there's just twins everywhere 
And you just go, why is that happening? And I'd started noticing that in certain suburbs, in certain educated, wealthy areas of certain cities in the world. And I went, it's time to do this show, I think. Because it's originally about, of course, the, the f uh, fertility or or lack thereof, or the question mark over the fertility of a peasant, of a fairly young peasant woman. Mm -hmm. She's only been married for a, a year, but already the taboo of her not being visibly pregnant, which, um, yeah, I just, I've been reading the Elena Ferrante books, and, and I'm sure a lot of you are too, or have, and it, it was kind of remarkable then reading it in, in, in that book that the same taboo in, in Naples in the, in the 60s uh, it once again kind of is alive. But certainly we don't live in a, in a world where quite the opposite sometimes, where everyone's going, um, you, you aren't anybody mm. until you're a mother. Um, that, of course happens in corners and pockets of society and is certainly something that a, a woman is defined by in all sorts of other ways, but it's not like as soon as you're 19, people are going, when are you going to get pregnant? So, of course, there are t s total question marks about what's the relevance of the trauma and the tragedy and the, and the arc of this thing now? What's the point of it? And can you reach those kind of... It was Lorca's attempt to create a Greek tragedy. Can you reach those tragic heights uh, with that as the core of your idea? And then I went, no, let's embrace the fact that we're not living in that world. Let's discuss what happens if you discover that you're bitten by the same bug as someone from that original uh, society and, you, and, and you're a woman who has defined herself entirely by not needing that in, the, in your life, by your career, by your intellect, by your imagination. Uh, and, and what happens in the battle between your sense of who you've decided to be identity-wise and your body if you've decided at some point that that's what you want? Now, I, I should point out here that normally if an artistic director calls you up and says, do you want to do Yerma? They're thinking that he would take Yerma and take Lorca's play and do it. A, this is a two-part question. A, do you think David Land expected you to do Lorca's uh, Yerma? And B, could you describe, which is what I think is remarkable, one of the many things remarkable about your work, the process of translating York, uh, Yorka, Lorca into, uh, into, what y into this time through your, the filter of your own experience. Did David expect you to do a, a, a Lorca play, actually, in, its, uh, in a translation? Um, yes and no. I mean, David had seen The Wild Duck, which I'd done, and, and so he didn't... He knew that I'd, I'd basically just throw the play out and write a, a new one, essentially. So he knew that? He expected He knew it. that. Uh -huh. But he had suggested things to me like Baal, the Brecht play, which I'd already screwed up once before and I wasn't willing to That's because to it's ruin already it screwed up. You can't um, screw up a screwed up play. It would, no, but I just didn't get it in any way right. Um, uh, and so he was suggesting things to me that you legally cannot rewrite. I mean, there's a famous story that the, um, the Germans in the room will know uh, of, of a production being shut down recently uh, for the fact that you can't rewrite it if you're going to call it Brecht's Baal. So he was suggesting ideas to me that I was like, I can't do what I do with that. We're just going to get shut down. Um, so there's no point there because what you actually need to do with that broken play is to write a new version. And there are certain broken plays out there that have the wait, most wait, extraordinary wait, wait, ideas. Are you talking about Baal or...? or? Baal. Okay. I, I but but, 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 but yeah. I'm, I, I'm talking about the moment where people ask you to do things, where you kind of go, can I do what I need to do? And so quickly, very quickly, I just checked the rights. I checked, I checked the legal situation. I checked all sorts of other things. I checked whether or not it was a thing that we wanted to be doing. Um, is it a story that means something to the world that we're living in? I'm not interested in doing plays, really. I'm not interested in directing something that that other direct, another director could do much better than me. And so what are you interested in doing, Simon? Um, 
um, I'm, in, in talking about ideas and, and reflecting the world that, that we're living in uh, and putting people on stage that, that, that are other people in the audience. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm, I'm not stuck between tr two traditions, but I live in two traditions. I live in the European uh, and the most extreme version of the European tradition, the German-speaking tradition, uh, and I come from an English-speaking tradition that, that are so diametrically opposed in terms of what the idea of creating modernity in theatre is. In the German-speaking world, not to generalise, it's about interpretation. It's through the director's interpretation of a text to create the political parallels to the world that you're living in now without certainly changing of bits of text uh, but with, and certainly with adaptations as well, but without large-scale um, kind of rewriting. There, of course, is also a new theatre, a new writing tradition that is amazing in the German-speaking world as well. But the new writing tradition uh, and the directing tradition of classics help together to create a picture of the modern world. Mm -hmm. In the English-speaking world, largely, the picture of the modern world is left to the people who are writing plays about now, mm -hmm. um, and not the people who are directing the classical plays. Um, and so I was interested in kind of going, what if I do a little bit of both of those things, mm. given that I was born in Switzerland and <laughs> grew up in England and Australia? Like, what if I mix my two, like, the two cultural t traditions? And that's how I've got to the point where I do, and people say to me, why do you not change the name of the play? And it's cause, because it is based on a myth called Yerma. Like, a, 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 and, and a painting of St. Sebastian by someone who paints now is called Saint Sebastian, and a painting that was painted 800 years ago of Saint Sebastian is called Saint Sebastian, and it's the reflection on a guy with arrows sticking out of him <laughs> that, that continues through history that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the Freudian idea of Electra is in Vienna in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. She's walking down the ring. That is Electra. She's also called you know, Gunhild or whatever else, but she is Elektra. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that sense of, you know, Nietzsche's I idea of eternal return, the, these things keep coming back to haunt us culturally, is exactly what I'm trying to do in the work that I'm doing. So I'm trying to write a completely modern play uh, that is about my experience and the experience of the people I know, but I, I, I'm also trying to like a phoenix rising out of the ashes or something, give birth to the original mythical figure again without any of the trappings of the history of how we've seen that show. You know, I have to say that maybe that's why I sent you a fan mail <laughs> because uh, I think what you're doing is, is revolutionary in a really good way. And I grew up very, very influenced before you were born uh, by the German sort of avant-garde at the time, you know, the, the earlier Schaubühne, some work of the, the, the Germans were really galvanizing to me. And I found then, and I, I'm overly, overly generalizing, but to a large extent, it got a little putrid now. Like, it's a little <laughs> tired, the, the description of the, the, the director's theater that's always reinterpreting and reinterpreting, and it's a little showy-offy. But what I found that you're doing is very, very... Um, uh, is point, very revolutionary in that it's pointing in a new direction that I find worthwhile. Like, we have to figure out how to tell stories again. We've deconstructed to a place where there's, there's no meaning anymore. We've just taken things apart, so we have to find new meaning. And I find that something what you're doing is finding out how to tell a story for now. And I wonder if your film background, your because uh, you've made films, it's so young, it's made films, and as an actor, that you're bringing perhaps a, a more of a freedom or permission because of your film background? I think that's right. I mean, I remember when I was, like when I made my first film as an actor, uh, when I was 19, I, we was, I, was getting, um, I was getting all these script updates to the, you know, and they changed the, this is back in the day that where they, 
you literally had one Bible of a script and that you would take out. You would get very complex instructions of which pages you had to take out and which pages you had to replace them with. And it was to a color-coded new re set of revisions. And this was a script that was being changed every day. So the you would be like you would go cycle through colors and you'd go back to pink again and then green again and you have a rainbow i still have this script is that your technique of writing is like that no not for me but um but no i i actually only write everything once um uh and then the actors say it and 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 i say maybe you could say that too oh. um and then someone else writes that down. Really? Yeah. Um, and then that becomes a, a, the. If you know, people, when people say to me, "Can you send me the play that you wrote um, from overseas or whatever?" Uh, I say, "I can't do that because I don't have it." <laughs> like I've only ever emailed a scene at a time to people. No kidding. Um, so I'm always <laughs> trying to maintain good relationships with my stage management because. Uh, and some day in future, I'll have to kind of email them and go, do you have a copy of that play that, that I apparently wrote? Um, and then they send it on, because they're the people who own it. They, 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 they're the people who, who know what the play is. So you have a structure and some scene ideas in mind. No, I write it all, but I don't, I don't put it into a document. I put it into an email and then send the email. So I could go back and reconstruct the plays that I've written by like Googling through my emails, like going All and right. putting that scene together and that scene. But the actors, you guys have way more of a sense of what the actual definitive version of the script is than, than, than I do, which is what's great because I can then listen to you guys doing it and then go, why did we do that? Do that instead. And you're like, you sure you want to change that? And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't seem, that, that would be better now. Okay, so that's, that's fascinating, <laughs> and it's clear that there are a lot of collaborators. Yeah. And uh, are you... Uh, There's two of the actors. I can see two of them, three. Well, maybe I, should... I heard Charlotte laughing I'm, before, I'm that's right. I'm yeah. curious as to what the rehearsals room is like then. I mean, one of the things that I was knocked out about and why I'm excited about seeing the play again tonight is the, dare I just use the very simple word of intensity. There is an intensity and a ferocity that you don't find very often. And I, based on what you just said, does that come from ownership? Is that because they yes. own it so much? That's really, really so brilliantly intuited. Um, <laughs> no, but that's, that's actually the 100% of the explanation. It's just, if you get, if you get, like the art, it's, it's the only art form that is created in the moment of it being created and disappears as it's being created. It's literally going, turning into vapour and disappearing as it's coming out of the mouth of the actors, as it's coming, the gestures disappear into an echo. Um, that is then just in the audience's mind. And the audience is a series of incredibly subjective minds that all remember things completely differently. Mm -hmm. There are people who think that there is furniture on stage for the entire show in Yerma, like genuinely. People who come to me and go, that scene with the, you know, the, where you know, she's at the coffee table, and I'm like, there's no furniture on stage in that scene. There is literally no furniture. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is no such thing as truth in theatre. It's just a series of subjective minds creating a narrative together, and it, and it disappears, and it goes. So, so the only possible way that the art form can um, have any sense of... Uh, I suppose, I guess the kind of very true expression of the art form is not the words that were written or the movements that were invented or the pictures that were put on stage. You know, the kind of great illusion of the idea that if you get a visual artist or an architect to design a set or, or if you, you know, that, that, that it'll therefore be pretty, uh, which it will be, uh, absolutely, it'll definitely be pretty. Um, uh, but there are plenty of art forms that, that need to be pretty, and, and theatre 
theatre, the aesthetic is, is, is actually irrelevant because it once again takes place up here. If an audience member can invent furniture in a room where there is none, mm -hmm. then stop thinking that your job is to create pictures because it's not. It's the I audience's job to create pictures. Um, uh, and so the only people who own it <laughs> are the actors. Because they, they, they own the story and they go on stage and they share it. And, then it, and then, it, then it belongs to the audience members. Well, perhaps I'm, I'm selfish in acting, asking this because when you started saying, describing what a rehearsal is like as you yeah. give some lines yeah. and then you listen to it and you say, no, no, say it that way. Yeah. I, I'm hungry to know a little bit more. Okay, so we, we meet and we talk a lot about our own lives and about the lives of other human beings that we know. Always kind of somehow trying to make sure that the relevance is to the themes that we're working on in the show. Uh, but sometimes not being able to hold to that. Um, uh, so you just kind of have this expansive getting to know each other process. Then you talk about what you want the plot of the play to be and you chat about that. But most of the time from then on involves a very private process for me, which is going home and writing at night time and then in the morning. And the then a very public process for us. And, and we rehearse for like two, three hours a day, max. Why so little? Because we just do the line runs and then we go home. You've picked that up from Ivo von Hova, except you've taken less. He's like four well, hours. No, well, you've, you've Ivo, Ivo's very different to how, how I rehearse. Ivo is never not rehearsing on stage. I don't let the actors on the set. And Evo comes in and says, so in this scene you're gonna move over there, then the camera's gonna come over here, and then you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna do that, and then you walk over there, and then you cover yourself in blood. And he's figured it out the night before with Jan, who is both his boyfriend and his set designer. And they sit in bed together, and they discuss it, and then they go and do it. <laughs> And it's an extraordinary way of making work, yeah. uh, which I am completely in awe of. And he's, they're good friends of mine, and I really uh, have been hugely inspired by what they do. But I do the opposite, mm. which is nobody's ever allowed to know what happens next. And if an actor ever asks me a question, I say, I don't know. Um, is that true? Is that true? No, 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 no. Is it true that you don't know? Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, um, Antonioni, the, the filmmaker Antonioni said, if an actor asks you a question, never tell them the answer. <laughs> yeah. Is it like that? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's... No, it goes back to this idea of subjective truth. I don't know what their... You know the Milan Kundera uh, section of The Unbearable Likeness of Being, where he, the Dictionary of Misunderstood Words is this kind of... It's the most heartbreaking section of a book about relationships ever. And it goes through people who grew up in the West and people who grew up under communism and their, underst uh, their understanding of certain words like freedom, parade, uh, love, sexuality, whatever. He goes through a series of words... And they're abusive for the person who brought, it was brought up in the West and, and, and incredibly important to the person who was brought up in the East or vice versa. So I don't know what your Freudian relationship is to me saying this scene is about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you have trauma, where you don't have trauma. I don't know where you have judgment and where you don't have judgment. I know when you're in a zone where I can see that you're being honest but I don't know how to tell you with my brain or with my words how to be that. I can just keep saying, yep, yep, yep. And I do it by going, you know, go and walk over there, stand still, move to the right, stop. <laughs> uh, start laughing. Why? Don't know, laugh. <laughs> um, and, and through the process of that, reality comes into being. Yeah. And I don't know why I'm asking for that, but these are words that don't, that have no room for us to be offended by each other's interpretation right. of humanity. And I'm not, I'm not a woman, I'm not a gay man, I'm not black, I'm not, there's so many things that I am not. <laughs> and I can respond to honesty, but I can't be that for you 
you can be that only for yourself and I can just be a sounding board to whether or not I feel moved. I'm a surrogate audience member. That's all I'm supposed to be So there. it's a very intense two-hour re rehearsal. Yeah. And are you... Are you um... And fun. Not yeah. always, yeah. <laughs> fun. He's fun. <laughs> he laughs. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you um, cranked up at the beginning of rehearsal, or do you just walk in? Low no, low? I'm generally feeling really insecure because we're about to read a scene that I've just written. Uh-huh. You're nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not dropping that uh, question completely, but I don't want to miss a certain area. And I'm trying to negotiate this without giving too much away. Um, when I heard w a little bit of the description of your production before I saw it last summer, the words that came through my brain was, because I didn't know your work, I was went, oh, Euro trash crap. <laughs> I don't know, glass, I have to see it through glass. <laughs> the design is extraordinary, and I'm really fascinated that you said you don't want to rehearse on the set. Yeah. Can you describe the process of design and, uh, because I found the opposite, it's the opposite of Euro trash, I found it actually intensified the experience, that glass. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, yeah, you know my question. Yeah, I do. Um, the reason I don't like actors to rehearse on stage is because I want them to own the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of want them to be able to tell each other's story in the pub, to tell each other's story on a train, to be able to tell each other's story in the dressing room, wherever, in a park. That's not the production. The production happens when an audience comes. Mm -hmm. And I don't want there to be any theatre until the audience is there. Like, I want it to start coming to existence in that moment. Um, so I design a set that I know will solve all of the storytelling problems that we're going to have uh, with the amazing l designer that I happen to be working with at that time. Lizzie uh, is, was the designer on this. Um, and as you guys will see who will see it, as you will have seen who have seen it, um, it has a whole heap of seemingly impossible to solve logistical problems involved in it. Um, so <laughs> I basically, like a child going, I want magic to happen tonight at my birthday party. Uh, I said that, I went, this is the magic I want to happen. And then she went, shit, how the hell am I going to do that? And went and figured it out and solved it. Um, but there's two different things going. So you said things like, I want a complete change of scene in, in 10 seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God bless Lizzie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a bit of experience with having done these kinds of magic tricks before on stage with different designers, but in different theatres in different ways. So I kind of had a few tricks up my sleeve that I was kind of, you know, like, I wanted to see what Lizzie would come up without me saying anything. Um, and, then, and then I kind of went, there's one thing we can do to help that, and that's this thing I know about, um, which I'm not going to tell you guys about. Um, uh, the, 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 but... The set is a, sem a semantic argument. It's basically just about the story. The set is just about being a vessel for the progression of the narrative. Um, it's then you, and then you put the actors in it, and they just kind of go, I'm on stage with you saying these words that I really know really well, but. I've never been here before, this is very strange. And then before they know it, the lights are out. And then the next lights are up and they're kind of, I'm now in the next scene that I remember the words for, but I don't remember why and what and blah, blah, blah. And you just don't ever let them stop having that confusion. <laughs> um, even up till telling you the other night, uh, basically saying, doing a line run with you guys wherever there was a scene where I thought that you guys were doing it a way that I'd seen it the same five times. And literally, as they were about to go on, going, no, don't do it like that. How should I do it? Don't know. So this is the, um, the age <laughs> And old, they were amazing. <laughs> this is the age old directing technique of destabilizing everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Which you, you know, it's but you put a framework in place that is that is unkillable, and then destabilization is reality. It is everything. It is humanity. It is. I said, uh, what did I say? I said, let, make it terrible and then save yourselves. Be shit, be shit. Be shit and then save it. What? Be shit and then save it. Uh, or, like I said the other night. Can you translate that for the rest? Be of ter- be be crap at telling. Be. Be, make mistakes right. and then have to save the meaning, not your performance. Right. <laughs> save the meaning. And the problem with, with the more often you do it, the more you kind of go, I'm saving my, I'm saving my performance. And it's very difficult, to, you know, people talk about the vanity of actors and it's kind of like very, very effing difficult not to be vain when you're standing with 800 people staring at you while you're doing a monologue. Like... You try it, uh, especially you try it half naked or completely naked or upside down or trying not to fall off or revolve. Like, of course they're vain. They need help not to be. <laughs> like, it's not, that, it's not that you, you know, you just have to kind of go, don't worry about it, you're, you're amazing all the time. That, that day in rehearsals where you completely forgot everything you were supposed to d- say and, and came up with something else, that's the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> Keep finding that place. So what's... For, make them love the person that they are when they're most vulnerable. The person that you meet in a pub when you give them actual ears and you actually listen to them. Help them with that rather than helping them figure out technique. That's, that's, I mean, technique is so... It can be learnt by everyone and it's so irrelevant if you find the people who know it really, really, really well. Of course you don't want people who have no technique, but you want people who have extraordinary technique and then just take all of it away from them. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes who they are yeah. as opposed to who the characters are. The characters are seen through their courage in a way, right? Yeah. Which is a beautiful thing to be in the room with. Just a, a funny a little question. I'm trying to say it again without giving up much away. <laughs> You've clearly been on the stage at moments, on your stage in there. Yeah. Do, you, do they have more or less contact with the audience? Can they see, what do they see? Do they sometimes see themselves? Uh, they uh, always see themselves. That's really disorienting, isn't it? I had an actor in Paris that I, uh, it's never happened to me before, but it hap- there was one actor in Paris that I caught looking at herself while she was acting. Like she was actually not looking out the window, she was looking at the reflection of and herself. You... And I went, are you looking at yourself? No, I'm looking out the window. And I'm like, don't, that's, you're really going to kill, the, kill your performance if you do that. Because she was worried about what she looked like. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we solved that. Um, so you really, you really do see yourself. Yeah. Um, and that's really hard. Um, and you see the audience and you hear them, but there's kind of like a... You're hearing them as much from, like, up there as you are. You're not hearing them from there. So if there's a big laugh, you hear it come over the top of the set and then down to you. So you know that something that happened in the last two seconds, give or take, was funny, but you don't know what it was, which one, which thing it was. You know, the, uh, so much of what you're talking about, which I love, is about human beings in a really imbalanced situation who are fighting for balance, and that's a beautiful thing. And yet, if you watch the production, it is technically spectacular. Like, it has technique in the staging, in the, cra- in the stage craft, in the lighting, in the sound, uh, in how they all work together. In, in guiding our eyes, uh, I'm again trying not to say too much. Um, so you, you, whether you admit it or not, you're you're a craftsperson. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just trying to. But I go about it the other. I go about it backwards, I suppose. I, I try to find the form that I think I need to liberate the. F- the feeling of the production 
and the most important thing there is that the actors don't need to sell the concept um, because the concept's already selling itself, so they can just be. Um, I, I used to do shows, <laughs> you know, in my, in my days of like, taking other people's plays and trying to find some kind of truth of them without touching the words. Um, and I used to hate bits that are of things that I had done and I would get the actors to solve it. Mm. I would have not been able to create any tension in a scene, so I would get the actors to create it for me. Um, and, and that felt always, I've always felt so dirty the morning after the premiere. I always felt like so embarrassed that I'd used the actors as the solution. Mm. That I tried to invent a form where you don't, for each production where I kind of know what the rules are for how to, you know, with this I wanted it to feel, with Yerma I wanted it to feel like it was a newspaper article that someone had read about what happens at the end of the show <laughs> um, and goes, how on earth did that happen? Mm -hmm. And then just a series of glimpses flashing in and out of a void of, of things that led up to that moment. That's exactly what it is. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. My goodness. And, <laughs> and I, we just I, got it. I, I, said, I said that to the actors and to the designers and I said that's what I wanted to feel like. Um, and so I created the form to, to find that notion um, so that the actors, the actor's when job is... When you say form, in this case, you mean design. I, I mean, but it's uh, design you can use in any way. Yeah. A room you can use in any way. The, the idea of short bursts of, of sometimes unintelligible reality disappearing, reappearing... Uh, who's on stage, who's not on stage, that it feels like a series of fateful cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and that the most important thing, if that's the meaning of the show that you're doing, is for the actors to have zero responsibility for creating tension. Mm -hmm. They just have to be. Um, and, and that's the hardest thing, of course, to do, as they will attest to like how do you just be how do you remove artifice a hundred percent it's so amazing that you say that because the art of there is clear artifice sometimes i think that the best uh theater is extreme artifice and no artifice the thing you can't fake that are together and you seem to have done that i'm also concerned about the time we uh, oh great okay uh, uh, the, the essentialness of what you see in this production, meaning uh, the best definition I ever heard of the theater, I read it a couple of years ago. Um, uh, it's by Paul Woodruff, who's a, a, uh, a philosopher. He wrote a book called The Necessity of Theater. And he said, theater is the art form wherein human beings make human action worth watching within a certain time and space. And one of the remarkable things about this is that there is no fat in your production. <laughs> There's a, a, a monumental um, momentum happening, and there's nothing that doesn't feel essential. There's not a gesture, and it all feels, to me, worth watching. I, I, this is not a question, <laughs> except that maybe you, could, you have a question. <laughs> How do you do that? Um. It helps when you're doing it with other people. It helps when you're... The great thing about writing, and this is something that we did, well, didn't make fully clear. We rehearsed for four weeks before we went into the theatre, and I wrote from the first day of rehearsals to, till then. So the play was written in four weeks. Although you had emailed scenes. I emailed them to the stage manager so that they could be printed out. So I would email them and then hop on the bike. And the, by the time I got to the rehearsal space, they would be printed out and we'd be able to read them. 
So, so the actors were reading them for the first time on that day. Yeah, the actors were discovering in bits of scenes, oh, that's what this scene's about. Crazy, crazy. Um, and then I was saying, let's go back and read it again now that we know what that's about. Um, but yeah, uh, that, it helps. Because you've got all of these people going, before they're terrified of telling you that it doesn't work because you've already written the whole thing and they want to kind of tactfully go, uh, uh, the second half doesn't really work, does it? Um, because also then you're kind of going, how do we fix that before the premiere? Because you've written this whole thing and of course you're attached to it because you spent three months in on an island off the coast of Italy writing it or whatever. You know what I mean? Which island would that be? I, I, I'm, I'm imagining Ibsen in that story. <laughs> in Ischia, he wrote a lot of his, his plays, um, uh, which is also in the Lena Ferrante novels. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it helps because you just kind of go, I'm just, yeah, let's try that. And I can immediately go, that bit's shit, that bit's not good, that bit, okay, let's get rid of that, do that. That bit's more honest. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that. And the designers can say, we, this, is, this is possible and this is impossible. So you change the order of the play. Mm -hmm. You set scenes that you were going to set in the garden in a, in a room. Like, you just keep changing it until you've got something that feels inevitable. It's like making a movie, like you said, you know, like yeah. if you can't get the location, write the scene into another location. And I think that what we so often do when we make theatre is think that there is one definitive thing, the text that's been created, uh, and, and all of the flexibility that everyone else has to have in order to bring that thing to life. And it's this kind of tyranny because the actors are constantly, either because of a bad director that's saying, can you solve that moment, or a, a text that was written for a very specific production in a very specific place, in a very specific era once long ago, mm -hmm. that was actually just a blueprint for a moment of theatre, has now become the Bible. <laughs> and the actors are kind of going, why is, do I have to stand on stage and do two pages of text that nobody's laughing at, nobody's responding to, nobody ever understands, yeah. and, and I'm just trying to do it. I have to do it. I'm going to do it. And you just kind of go, why, why do... The actors are the only important people in theatre. They're the people who own the theatre. They're the art form itself. It's the only art form that is actually carried in bodies, in minds, in souls. Why are we keeping on getting in the way of the fact that it's just about them and that everyone else has a job because they go on stage and own a story. Mm -hmm. And n writers don't have jobs because, because uh, you know, because they're geniuses and actors get to do their work. Because I can read a writer's work if I want to. I don't need a an actor for that. A writer is literally just a servant of an actor. That's all they're there for. A director is a servant of an actor, a set designer, a lighting designer. Everyone else is just there for them to have moments of pure existence. And in 50 years' time, people say, I saw Paul Schofield's Lear. Mm. And we know that that was directed by Peter Brook. Right. We do. But the audience member goes, I saw Paul Schofield yeah, as right. Lear. Right. Because that's what's burned into their brain. Nobody knows what this guy looks like. Right. They know what happened in front of them looked like, and that's all we're here for. That's all we're trying to create. Um, so that's how you can end up creating stuff like that. It's because you're literally just kind of going, and if it's not working, it's not working. You can walk away and say, the actors weren't very good in that production, it was the actor's fault. And you can kind of go, yeah, but you could have found something that they could do. <laughs> Like, you could have. Everyone is capable of something. Yeah. So why are you wasting your time going, they're not uh, capable of yeah. you know, bringing my ideas to the stage? You just go, find out what they are capable of. Cut the whole scene and do the juggling act that they're amazing at. Like, seriously, do that. Yeah. Make sure that there is nothing shit on stage. And if that means that none of the play is left there and you've literally just got a two-hour juggling act, then maybe you should be working in a circus. Like... <laughs> I, like, I don't know, like, you know what I mean? I do. It's just a moment of entertainment or challenge of the audience. That's all it's there for. Yeah. 
And the thematics of it exist in the bodies and the souls of the performers. You know, not only are you a damn good director, writer, <laughs> you're also very eloquent, damn you. <laughs> Um, thank you for the window into the world. I think it's a great way to either having seen the production or going to see it is, is this has been really fantastic for me. I hope it was for you too. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. <laughs>